Welcome to this special edition of Full Prefrontal, the big picture series. Coupled with our extensive library of conversations with leaders in the fields of neuroscience and cognitive, educational, and social psychology, in this special series, Sucheta plans to dive deeper into the science of executive function, including managing oneself and one's cognitive resources in order to achieve goals. Throughout the Big Picture series, we'll explore the difference between knowing and doing. She will share real-life examples and day-to-day -day tips for practicing intentional strategies to help you, your family, your team members, or your students build competencies in executive function to lead to stronger, more resilient relationships, sustainable communities, and fulfilling lives together. And now, here is our host, Sucheta Kamath. Welcome back to this special edition of the Full Prefrontal Podcast, The Big Picture Series, a discussion about why executive function matters. As always, I'm here with my host, Sucheta Kamath. Hello, Sucheta. Good to see you. What is this discussion all about? Why are we doing this? Great question, Todd. So executive function, as you know, we are deep into 50 episodes of this podcast, and I thought it might be a great idea to pause a little bit and revisit the why and the how and why does this all matter? So I thought we'll take a minute to discuss the nature of executive function, the scope of executive function, and implications of executive function in everyday life. And I hope the listeners have gotten a sense that we have been having guests in various walks of life. Some specialize in studying children, some work with neuroscience, some work with cognitive sciences, some have anthropological background. So all that eventually ties to executive function. And I thought might as well take a minute and uh, revisit these ideas and lay out a structure so those who are interested in understanding the relevance and importance of executive function might find this overview very valuable. And the big picture to me always is like bird's eye view. You know, yeah. if you start, start in high up there and taking a, a perspective, then you can see the vast ramifications of the skill set. I was having lunch with somebody yesterday with these five women, women CEOs, and the discussion led to a lot of them talking about hiring people and really running into problems and struggling with or their own struggles in when is the right time to fire them. And most women at the table said they take too long to fire them because they're just not comfortable. But they were also saying that they also are greatly in hope of that these people will change their ways. And so that got me into the discussion with them about something called soft skills. You know, so all these people were hired for the way they look on paper. They had great credential. They had great degrees. They also probably interviewed decently well. But what was put to test is, can you get the job done? And can you get it done without much instructioning? And can you take the initiative and solve the problems and take care of stuff without needing too much handholding? And most of them who were dissatisfied with these employees were complaining about needing too much handholding. And so that's why this conversation that how that exact description of these people worthy of being fired are demonstrating failure in executive function. So I hope that made sense. It did. You know, 50 plus episodes of this show, the thing that has surprised me the most is how pervasive executive function is and how a lot of your focus, I believe, is more towards the student. But every one of us in every walk of life and virtually every discipline, this is the idea of executive function is critical to our ability to survive and thrive. So it's been fascinating to me how many walks of life uh, executive function touches. So that's probably very appropriate that we pause, reflect a bit on this series so far and really get the kind of reattain that big picture. So I think that's a, a great thing. I'm looking forward to it. So I guess what we should do in leading off this discussion is uh, probably remind everyone exactly what executive function means. That's a great start for us. So I'm going to kind of give some quotes about various experts in the field and what they say. So we have had Paul Zelazo, and so he defines executive function this way. He says executive function comprises the ability to be mentally and behaviorally flexible to changing conditions to provide coherence and smoothness in one's response. And sorry, it's so technical, but during ongoing and new encounters with the environment, executive function questions and relates to ongoing goal achievement. So these two questions are like, how does this relate to me and what should I do now? So let's kind of disassemble this or kind of break this down into parts. So what speaks to me about this definition is number one is adjusting 
mentally and behaviorally in a flexible way to changing conditions. And for example, you and I sat down to do this interview and I said, I would love to have a cup of hot tea. And so you went to the station where there's a hot tea kind of situated and you came back and said, well, the guy was cleaning. And so that required you to wait, which required me to wait. And that is literally that waiting for the guy to clean the machine so that he, it dispenses hot water is behaviorally and mentally flexibly adjusting to the changing condition. And what was the condition that changed? That the coffee machine and the hot water machine should operate without any hitch. It didn't. And that required you to pause and stop and adjust and not throw a tantrum, which you didn't, <laughs> or for me to kind of lose it, which I didn't, that I don't have the tea and I want it now. So that's the first part of it. Does that make sense? Makes all kinds of sense. I mean, and as I go through the world, uh, these scenarios, you encounter these scenarios virtually every minute of the day, don't you? Yes. You know, it just reminded me of a story. I'll give you a, a comparison. I was listening to this amazing man called Pico Ayer. He's an author, a writer. He's followed Dalai Lama for the last 20 years and has written a lot about it. And now he writes these reflections about stillness and mindfulness. Brilliant, brilliant writer. And he was telling his story that his house burned down. This was 20 years ago when he lived in California and their old house burned down. And he said, the house burned down. And the next day he said, I woke up with nothing. And I went to a local store nearby and bought a toothbrush. That was the only thing I had in my possession. And that was the only possession I had. And the next question is, what would I do next? And so apparently one of his friends who was a teacher said, there's a monastery nearby. Why don't you stay a few days there? And it was in complete isolation and hills of uh, California. And he said, sure. He had no options. And what was so beautiful about this is once he arrived in this barren it was a monastery, as you can imagine. It was very barren. A room had a bed and a nightstand, a lamp, and that's it. And a large very window, minimal. very minimal. And the large window opened up into this big valley. And he said, I had nothing. And I had this incredible view. And that view reminded him, he uses this term that, imagine you have a camera in your hand and you've been taking pictures, but the shutter is on. And this experience made him feel like the shutter was taken off and he had much grander, clearer sense of the view of the world. But the backdrop was he had nothing. His house, he lost everything in fire. He had no possessions and he had no clear idea where he was going. And that was so poignant. And now I'm going to give you another example, which is just opposite of this. So this is a story written by John Grisham. And in his career, this is the only story that is actually based on the truth or the real episodes of life, <laughs> real right, life. Right, right. And it's a nonfiction called The Innocent Man. Mm. And it's a story about a murder that happened in 1980s and how it was mismanaged. And two people were put on death row and they actually had not committed a crime. But one of the stories that struck a chord with me was there was a man in the story who Actually, so John Grisham was asked, how did you get started with this whole writing about this story? This is in Ada, Oklahoma, a tiny, tiny town where they had never heard of a murder. Turns out, he said, the headlines read that a very accomplished athlete from Ada, Oklahoma, who was marked to become this uh, national baseball player, became a death row inmate. Mm. And what was the trajectory of this young man and why did he land there? And he said, I just couldn't believe it. An athlete, you know what goes into becoming an athlete. You have to be disciplined and kind of have a lot of practice and focus and commitment. And he did have that. And so the backdrop of this story was this young man who got drafted from high school, went to play professionally, had a lot of setbacks. He was really managing himself very poorly. So he kind of got into women, drinking, drugs, and he had an injury. And after the, he had that injury, he became disabled and not able to play. And he was put on the bench and then eventually was thrown out of the team because of this bad behavior and then moved back into his tiny town, lost everything he had. And so it's a colloquial fire that I'm talking about with Pico Ayer that I described mm -hmm. that made him lose everything. And so these are two individuals when they experience loss, one found himself and one lost himself. And to me, that is what gets me thinking about executive function, because it is that changing conditions in life that command or ask us to adjust in a flexible way, but in order to provide coherence 
and smoothness to one's life. Coherence is maintaining meaning in life. And, you know, Dr. Tim Pitchell, as one of my guests, and we talked about this existential crisis, why people don't do what they want to do, they mean to do, they keep you know, destined themselves to accomplish this goal, but they don't because they have this existential kind of dilemma inside that, do I really need to do this? Does this even matter? And those who actually in crisis do not lose sight of the bigger picture of life tend to adjust, adapt and do well. And that's why we are talking about this. Well, I've heard you talk about one of the goals of all of this, right, is to yield outcomes that are social, emotionally desirable, appropriate and future centered, right? Isn't that what you're aiming for? Yes. Well, not me. I mean, every all of us should be aiming for. Right. But yes, this is exactly what I talk about in terms of who is successful or what does training or supporting or helping people to develop executive function looks like. So as I continue this conversation, I want to bring in another definition. This is given by Guer and Dawson. And, you know, Peggy Dawson was one of my guests as mm-hmm. well. So according to Peggy Dawson and Guer, they define executive function as neuropsychological concept referring to the cognitive process required to plan and direct activities. And what are these activities? Task initiation, follow through, working memory, sustained attention, performance monitoring, inhibition of impulses, and goal-directed persistence. And again, sorry for these technical terms, but what it means is, again, can I direct myself By following a plan that I create for myself, can I inhibit the impulse to do something else? Can I continue to watch myself and monitor myself? And can I persist? And no matter what the circumstances are, can I persist? And all these skills collectively are called executive function. And again, going back to you and I, for example, as you uh, take a flight from Chicago to Atlanta to come and produce a show, you have to stay persistent. For example, if you have somebody ahead of you who's taking too long to remove their shoes or they haven't bothered (laughs) to remove the pennies from their pockets or they have their cell phone on them as they go through the machine and they have to come back. And as you're witnessing other people's poor management of self, not losing your focus or your own patience is really critical in you achieving your goals. And how many times we have talked about people losing their mind when they are at the airport. So there's one thing to do well when things are going well, and the other is to do well even when things are not going well. And that's where executive functions really help. Executive function at its heart is this set of abilities where you continue to do well, persistent with this intention to achieve goals that you have for you without losing your uh, big picture connection. All right. Well, you just uh, made it very clear why I have such stress and frustration at the airport is apparently at the airport, everyone loses their ability to have proper executive function because <laughs> there is some intriguing behavior found in the airport. Well, I've heard you talk about this idea of, of ongoing goal achievement. Talk about that in the context of executive function. So, yeah, ongoing goal achievement is, for example, if I am writing with a pen and my pen doesn't work, I am interrupted. So then now I have a new goal, which is find another pen. And this happens to me often. Then I start going through my bag and I can't find another pen. So now, even though my writing was my goal, now I have a new goal, which is to find a new pen. And there are people who actually get sidetracked by this new goal. For example, in order to search for a pen, I leave the room where I was doing the work. And now I'm in another room. And then I notice that in that room, there's a lot of chaos. So, for example, there is laundry that's been not folded, the drawers are open, and also file folders are out on the table. And now what I'm doing is now start sorting through the files or start folding the laundry. So that ongoing goal achievement is now I have lost track of my original goal, which is to actually finish writing. And I had a temporary but short and new goal, which is find a pen. Now I have a massive new goal, which is get the laundry done. And so those who have good executive function, in fact, Don't give up the original goal that got interrupted because of something that came up that was not something they were hoping for. And so this ability to interact or brush against the environment and still stay committed to the goal that you have is great executive function. And so as I was mentioning earlier, the two self-guiding questions people with good executive function ask is, how does this relate to me and what should I do now? And so constantly asking yourself to redirect, redirect, redirect is something that leads to more proficient ways of getting things done, maintaining good emotionality in it, and also serving the bigger picture. So if you ask me what is my definition of executive function, this is how I define executive function. 
So executive function refers to the choreographed ability to make yourself do what you intend to do using the capacity and vision for self to yield or to get the outcomes that are socially, emotionally desirable, appropriate, and above all, future-centered. That means this is not just serving the need of the moment, but it's also connecting to your future behaviors. And now, what does the future look like? Which you asked earlier that it's very important to understand the future self. So it could be the future of five minutes, future of one hour. It could be future of the day. It could be in one week. It could be 10 months. It could be a year or 10 years. So not eating that cookie is serving the purpose of feeling excited and happy And I'm maybe doing that because I'm stressed. But if that doesn't serve my bigger picture, which is there is a wedding in March that I need to go to, then serving that future goal becomes a priority in the middle of me wanting to eat that cookie. And that intercepting your current action with the intention of checking in with your future is really important thing that people with good executive functions do effortlessly. Is it different in terms of how you deploy your executive function when you're thinking about a future that's an hour away versus one that's five years away? Yes. Well, an hour away goal is better formulated because it's closer to you. It's in focus. Rarely people actually sit down and have well mapped out steps to a future goal. So for example, a future five year down the road goal, maybe I want to have $10,000 in savings in my account. The $10,000 five years down the road is great conceptually, but what steps does that mean? So literally 10,000 over five years means 2,000 at the end of each year. So now how does at the end of next year, I should have 2,000 extra above and beyond my projected savings. Now that requires me to now monitor if I take those $2,000 I'm making this up, then I'm breaking this down into maybe $150 per month. Now, if I break that down into $150 of savings above and beyond what I was already thinking or not thinking, not calculating my raise, then that breaks down into four weeks. So I'm now looking at something like maybe $30 to $40 per week if I'm saving. Then I am now beginning to think that I'm getting closer to my $10,000 goal. Now, only if you break that down so in such a minor way or with great attention and care, only then you can monitor your behaviors in on a daily basis. So for example, if I am, and this typically happens at night for all of us, is I'm on Amazon and I'm buying dog food and I have an option to buy 15 pound bag and save by buying maybe 35 pound bag. I'm just making this up. Do I make a wise decision based on my future in mind and how much saving would that contribute? So that's one thing. The dog food buying is inevitable. If you want to raise a dog and take care of your dog, you don't have an option of not buying the food. But if I'm now looking at a scarf, which is my 15th scarf, and I don't need that scarf, then saving that $35 on the scarf is a wise decision because that $35 can help me reach my $10,000 goals. Does that make sense? Makes sense. So most people struggle in connecting with their future self that's five years down the road is because they haven't really broken it down into parts and steps. And so it's not concretized enough. So it's much easier the near the future, more in focus, further the future, less in focus. And so it's really hard to kind of connect to that plan, which is only going to come to fruition five years down the road. All right. Well, so listening to you there, Sajeda, It almost sounds like you're talking about self-optimization. So I guess it's fair to say that people with great executive function skills are functioning optimally, yeah? Absolutely. And so let's look at self-optimization. What does that mean and what does that look like? So self-optimizing means I am putting the most optimal effort to get the best results for me and not in a selfish way, but in an enlightened self-interest way. That means as I achieve the goals for me, I'm not causing any harm to others, as well as I'm not taking away the opportunities of others to achieve their goals. So, for example, in a classroom, if a teacher asks a question, a self-optimized student answers a question by raising his hand, but he doesn't raise the hand if he has already answered the question two times. So self-optimization is socially relevant. Same way, if you're sitting around the table, And we have ordered two large pizzas, which has eight slices each. 
and there are six people. And so we quickly do a mental math and make sure that 12 slices means everybody gets two. And we have 16. That means we have four more slices left. Self-optimized person is the one who says, I will hold back my hunger and see who wants to take third slice. So there's a element of social regulation in self-optimization. So the self-optimized person is also aware of self and has a great sense of what is working and what's not working. So self-optimized person says, you know what, this didn't work. So I'm going to do this differently. So in order to do differently, you need to have a great sense of what went into doing it and why did it not work well. So I'll give you an example. I used to have a client who was in his late 30s, and he told me that there was a major event coming that he was preparing for, which is his baby turning one. And he said, I am not helping my wife at all. And she's kind of upset with me. So she has given me one job. And my job is to organize all the pictures of the baby and put them into some montage so we can play that during this first birthday. And it was uh, literally three days before the baby's birthday. The whole family was coming, you know, from each side and they had invited guests. There were probably 40, 50 people and they had rented a hall and he was not prepared. He did not have all the pictures. He had not told his wife he had not did not have the pictures. He was scrambling and he was so stressed out that he was not doing what he should have done, which is reach out, tell people, ask for help, adjust, adapt. No, he had not done any of that. So we kind of discussed this and I kept asking him, how is it going between you and your wife? And he says, what do you mean? I said, she sounds like she might be upset with you if you are not doing your job, but you haven't even shared with her that you are not doing your job. And he said, no, 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 everything is perfect. No problem. The event happens, as you can imagine. And next week when he shows up, he says, my wife wants a divorce. Mm. And it was very shocking to him. The next day after the birthday, the wife at breakfast told him she wants a divorce. And he was so caught off guard. He was absolutely unaware that there was some anything going on in the marriage that kind of led to this divorce request. And he was blindsided and he was angry and upset, but he literally felt that it was because of these pictures that he did not put together, the montage, mm -hmm. which was not done very well. And I said, is it possible that it's something else or in addition to the montage? Or is the not putting together the montage was just the, the straw that broke the camel's back? Right, right. So people who are not functioning optimally have very poor insight and they are not able to recognize their behaviors and their mental adjustment affects the world around them. But they also don't recognize that other people are evaluating or seeing the way they are carrying out their life's mission in the steps they take. And when they are not optimal, it affects their partner's ability to be optimal. So there is a boomerang effect and it creates a chaos, not just with the individual who is not optimally functioning. And now you can imagine in business world, for example, if you are a team member amongst 10 and you're not picking up or pulling your weight, you are going to be a burden for the entire team. And so eventually, so beginning people might tolerate it, then people might be irritated with you. And eventually people are going to outcast you or they are going to ignore you or exclude you. And eventually you're going to get fired. So that's what I mean by self-optimization has such an impact on the way you think of the problem, the way you evaluate outcomes, the way you change your approach and the way you understand its impact on others. And those with great executive function has incredible sense of self-optimization and they are attuned with their performance and outcome. All right. So if I'm understanding this correctly, there are, you can be very intentional or you can have very automated or automatic processes. Uh, so it sounds like you're saying to be successful, to be more optimal, you have to be very, very intentional. So well said. Yes. So executive function, in essence, is intentionality. You have to have purpose, but you also have to pay attention and you have to watch what you're doing, why you're doing what you're doing. And if it's not working, you need to change what you're doing. And so that to change, you need to really get off the autopilot and get intentional into the intentional mode. So I want to kind of bring in this idea of habits and executive function. So in order to become very optimal, you need to have routines and habits. They're very, very essential, by the way. So what is a routine? Routine is something that you have decided intentionally previously. It has sequence of steps that follow themselves. And you don't have to like intentionally say, what do I do next? 
It's automated. And so when you follow an automated predetermined sequence of events, it becomes smooth and it brings efficiency. However, the real executive process kicks in when something is not working well. So for example, you do not need to bring the physicist mind when you're loading the laundry, right? It's not a massive problem that you're trying to solve. However, let's say you're loading and you drop the first bunch of clothes into the washer and you hear cling, you know there are some coins or something metal into the washer mm -hmm. and you remove them. So automatic thing is to load and then pour and close and press. That's the automatic process or automatic thought process that's involved in doing the laundry. But hearing the cling or eh, any noises that tell you that it's not going right or needs to be intercepted, you changing your autopilot and bringing intentionality, that's executive function. So a couple of things happen to people that do not have great executive function. One is they do not pay attention to that little cling that they heard and they ignore it. Or they also do not know why that stopping, pausing, reflecting is essential in this context. So they're misjudging the situation, which calls for a novel response versus automatic response. And so it's really important to be intentional, but you also need to be very attentive and you need to have some critical thinking in place. Bottom line is to do all these things, you need to be so mindful. So you have to be very mindful in the moment. Why am I doing what I'm doing? How does this matter? And is it giving me the results I want? And so those who do this kind of self-check tend to do better. Well, so you're not always going to get an obvious signal like loose change in a washing machine to say, oh, I need to change something. Uh, you, that's where self-optimization comes in because you might those signals won't always be obvious. And so sometimes routines are good in some respects, but even those will need to change from time to time, yes? Yes, yes. And so this happened to me a couple of weeks ago. I had a brake pad wear tear oh. signal. <laughs> And now I had a critical decision to make. So it was not that I was not paying attention. I was very much paying attention to my car when I started it and when the message would pop. And then I had to take, get off the autopilot, which is just get into my car, drive, get my business done. It required intentional step, which is then call the dealer, make an appointment, find time, drop the car, get a loaner, then find the insurance. There were so many steps involved in taking care or responding to this message. So there was that reluctance on my part to not make that call because it had too many steps. So yes, the intentionality is there, but knowing how intentionality means more work, sometimes people don't want to do more work. And so they're just avoiding it. And that's why they're either procrastinating or they choose a path of less optimal functioning or they delay the goal achievement. And as a result, then they are stranded. For example, I don't know how long I could have driven that car with the uh, brake pad wear and tear signal. And eventually maybe I was not going to be able to brake. And maybe that's when I would actually go and take care of it in crisis. <laughs> Common tale, unfortunately. <laughs> so yes, executive function is constantly bringing in focus when things are not going well. And once things are not going well, you have to decide what steps to do. Should I continue or should I do different? And yes, oftentimes there is no loose change banging around the washer that tells you take a different action. All right. So thinking here a lot about this being and operating optimally, and, and it sounds like this is, if I'm understanding you correctly, this is an ongoing exercise. This is something we always have to be working on always this idea of self-optimization. It's This is a lifelong thing, right? I mean, so I guess there's lifelong benefits to good executive function. There's real lifelong implications to all this, yes? Oh, yes, absolutely. So you can see if you are a child with great executive function, then you are able to manage your attention, manage your own goals well, you are listening, you're following through, you're getting work done, and then you become this amazingly independent student in the classroom and you become a joy to teach. And when I say joy, it means you can be an adorable kid, but you may not be the joy to teach <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> because you, you are difficult. That means you don't cooperate. You don't follow through. You don't do what you say you will do. You're not proficient. Then you have this 
young child who becomes a teenager and he is ready to embark upon life's mission, which is to go to college, let's say, and, and manage to live in the dorm by himself, go to classes by himself, no nudging by parents. You know, you need to set the alarms and then you attend all the classes. You meet these deadlines, which are much more obscure than the way it was in high school. And you also need to balance that you're drinking, you know, Thursday night drinking to a kind of taking part in classroom discussion versus turning all the assignments, joining protest on campus. <laughs> as well as maybe, you know, become a campus editor, you know, newspaper editor. That's like the balancing act. And then you become this employable individual, which leaves college with this degree. And now you have a resume. And this resume is something people look at and say, OK, so looks like you have this education. Can you function as part of a team? And then you get hired. Now you have to show that you can actually show up on time. You actually take part in all the meetings. You take the essence of that meeting. You create a task list for yourself. You meet the numbers, you meet the deadlines, and you do all it takes. Or you maybe stay longer or maybe stay up later and you produce the products that your team wants you to do. If there's a hitch, then you go and approach your boss, ask for help. You advocate for yourself. And then you also are the individual who needs to manage your relationship at home, whether it's a girlfriend or you're on the dating app or you like to play online video games. You need to now say to yourself that, you know what, 2 a.m. is too late. And then you need to sit, take care of your car by paying the insurance, taking care of the oil change. You have to clean the car. You have to make sure that you put gas regularly. I cannot tell you how many young adults I work with who have called somebody to get them or call AAA because they ran out of gas. Mm -hmm on the side of the highway. So those are the things that allows you to kind of just run your life as if it's a company. And then eventually then it leads to that that long-term plan. As a independent entity, can you now are supporting yourself, but also are you contributing to your society? Are you contributing to the causes that bring uh, harmony in the universe? Are you taking on something that brings meaning to your life? So all those range of skills that happen over time from zero to 90 requires executive function. And just to quickly juxtapose this with all the research that talks about poor executive functions have tremendous implications in successful life. Let me kind of give you some overview. Researchers talk about that if someone is diagnosed with mental disorder, they are going to experience impaired executive function. So let me give you a list of some mental disorders. ADHD, attention deficit, and hyperactivity disorder. It is actually considered a, a mental disorder in which you're not able to control your attention and you're not able to manage your goals. And that actually is going to lead to executive dysfunction. And it's going to have a lot of impact on your ability to stay goal oriented and manage your relationships and be successfully able to adjust and adapt, as I was talking about earlier. Uh, conduct disorder, which is a 20 to 30 percent of ADHD population also has additional conduct disorder. That means you're likely to be more defiant. You're likely to be more difficult. You're likely to be delinquent. And if you have those kinds of difficulties because of the wiring in your brain or the brain chemistry, you are going to have executive function problems. Addiction in individuals with addictive personalities are shown to have executive function disorder, schizophrenia, and depression. So we have research that actually shows that these mental disorders are likely to be affiliated with, or there's a direct correlation between these mental disorders and executive dysfunction. And often in my practice, I find that when you go to see a psychiatrist or your primary care physician or general notion in commonsensical notion that public has is they are focused on the mental disorder, but not the underlying executive function. And they're not receiving any help in developing these skills and abilities that make you self-optimal. The second part of this is poor executive function is shown to be related to physical and health challenges. For example, obesity is linked with executive function problem, poor ability to actually regulate the food intake, your eating habits, and your consumption of alcohol and drugs is related to poor executive function. But what I find very fascinating is there's a genuine poor treatment adherence if you have executive function problems. And what does that mean? Well, that means the very mental disorder gets you this prescription to take pills. And then you need executive function to actually take pills on time, yep. get the refill done, and actually monitor your sleep and not mix alcohol and those kinds of recommendations. But your treatment adherence is impacted by poor executive function. 
And that means your success in managing these mental disorders or physical ailments is going to be compromised. So you see how tremendously impactful that can be. Another little important caveat there is that poor executive function is shown to be directly correlated with school readiness. So when a child from zero to five goes through these developmental stages, his readiness to start kindergarten and show that capacity to actually be a good member of kindergarten class is directly correlated to strong executive function. So it, this kind of is very, very interesting. Research shows that the entry-level reading skills, entry-level math skills, or even IQ doesn't have that impact in determining the success with which you will experience that adjustment in kindergarten. But executive function purely is shown to have that impact. So it's really, really important. And again, what Todd, what I'm saying, is this part of the everyday conversation? No. No. We are not having this conversation, right? Often. The next thing, set of skills that, that are really fascinating is executive function predicts both reading and math competence by the time somebody graduates from high school. So in order, so in, fundamental role of education is what? Is to prepare the student to understand how to learn and think, to become competent so you can become this critical thinker and learner that can take on life's challenge, right? right. You need executive function to manage your learning and manage your relationship to the classroom in which you're learning. So what if you have poor executive function, then it affects your classroom attention, which affects your love for learning. So that means I see all the time students who love math tend to do better in math, but the same same student with same mind tends to do poorly in history because he hates history. Now, however, if you have really bad history grades, that means if you're failing in history and you are doing advanced math, you really can't go to the next grade. And this is lost on a lot of students because they are not able to afford the same attention and intention to subjects that they don't like as much as they are able to do for subjects they love. And this is executive dysregulation. That means you're not able to manage your effort based on your interest or lack thereof. And that's uh, very critical. Now, moving on to now this person has been educated. Now, as I was talking to you earlier, employability. Mm -hmm. So how does this employability relate to executive function? Research shows that your ability to be productive or your productivity is directly related to executive function. So people with poor executive function take too long. They tend to not work smarter, but they tend to work harder if they do work hard. (laughs) And they actually show that sometimes they get hired for the right reasons because the way they look on paper Mm -hmm. and they get fired for not actually showing up with the set of skills they are promising on paper. So they are just likely to not keep the job they receive. The next tier of problem in terms of lifelong implications is poor executive function is linked with marital harmony. Mm. So people with poor executive function tend to be less dependable as spouses. They tend to act more impulsively. They tend to be argumentative or difficult to deal with. They tend to be inflexible and they tend to lose the forest for the trees. That means they don't understand these sacrificial acts that we do for the other in good faith effort to bring pleasure or joy or ease up other person's burden. And so people with executive function problem tend to be not mindful of those little uh, nuances. And hence, uh, other people tend to be annoyed with such individuals. And it leads to that uh, a breaking point where there there tends to be more divorces with uh, associated with person with executive function problems. And last, a couple of things to talk about lifelong implications is Poor executive functions are associated with social problems. And what are those social problems? Criminality, Mm -hmm. criminality, which is intention to harm or intention to take away something that belongs to others, just not having a, a good impulse control, but also not thinking through about consequences. So there's tends to be more recklessness in in terms of their behaviors. And there's a lot of emotional outbursts. So getting angry and hence taking these steps such as hurting somebody tends to happen with people with executive function. So I just can't emphasize enough that this term I know is an enigma for many, but I'm hoping through this discussion today, I've kind of laid out this big picture of executive function and how critical it is for us to pay attention to it, really take all the effort that we need to either polish these skills and help people become more self-aware. Well, you know, just hearing you talk, you know, 
we talk a lot about the self, right? We talked about the future self and the optimized self-optimization, all this, quote, self. But this has a real impact on society. Think about all these problems that, ha- that exist in our society. You can, you can attribute a lot of those to executive function, right? So rightly said, Todd. You know, as we conclude this episode, what I want to really say is we need to think about societal prosperity. What does that societal prosperity look like? That means when you take care of you and I take care of me, when you and I work together, we are more motivated and centered to do better for for the collective good. And the collective good can become a priority if your personal needs are taken care of. And a lot of times, because of the executive dysfunction and mismanagement of self and mismanagement of goals, you're really not in alignment of bringing or putting needs of the other uh, as an equal priority. And so I find that these individuals tend to be less competent team members. They are not the most flexible individuals, so they become the naysayers. They are less likely to collaborate and cooperate when it takes when it is required to work with other people. And of course, you can imagine it impacting the innovation and imaginative workforce. So what we need to really be thinking about is not just the limited sense of I when we talk about optimization, but by optimizing self, you're optimizing society. And it's such a wonderful way to bring joy to the world. All right. Well, as I just said a minute ago, I I've never really thought about the idea of executive dysfunction so, so impacting our society and culture and our relationships and our education and the workplace. It's just fascinating to think about and how this impacts the big picture. So, all right, well, that's all the time we have for today on this special edition, Full Prefrontal. We'll return soon with the Big Picture series, a continued discussion on why executive function matters. Thank you for listening to Full Prefrontal, exposing the mysteries of executive functions. To contact our host, Sucheta Kamath, and learn more about her work on improving executive functions, visit her website at CerebralMatters.com. That's CerebralMatters.com. Tune in next week for the next informative episode of Full Prefrontal.